Hi, welcome to Minds Behind Maps. I'm Maxim Lenemond with a bit of COVID left and a cough. And this is the latest episode in this experiment where I want to sit down with people who are creating and using anything geospatial to try to understand more about the field and the people in it. Today I'm talking with uh, Dan Pilon, the co-founder and CEO of Element84, a company started about 12 years ago, focused on geospatial software development. I wanted to talk to Dan about what it had been like to be working in the industry and growing a business around geospatial for more than a decade. The technologies we use to build our maps, manipulate satellite imagery and process them at scale changes at a pretty rapid pace. So I thought this might be an interesting opportunity to talk a bit about how the tools we've used have evolved over the past decade or so. Element 84 has been involved in putting some Sentinel-2 imagery onto the open data registry by Amazon Web Services. That's AWS in short. The Sentinel satellites provide lots of imagery every day. It's probably the most commonly used and commonly known optical imagery to date. And it achieves this by being free and providing a global coverage of the Earth nearly every week. While being a European project under the European Space Agency, I was curious to know a little bit more as to how this data ends up being mostly accessible by an American, EAAWS, company. We touch on the need to make data more accessible, as well as the incentives and financials on how and why a company like AWS is interested in hosting this data. Dan co-founded the company with his wife Tracy, which is also something that we touch upon. The second half of this conversation is about how Dan and Tracy have built Element 84, some of the mistakes but also the good decisions that have been made along the way, and how they've hired people in the technical field like the one of Geospatial. By the way, don't worry, this voice doesn't carry over in the conversation. I thankfully was doing a little bit better when we did this recording. This was a pretty fun conversation. I came out of it with a bigger respect for what Dan and his team are doing and how Element 84 have been building slowly over the years. In many ways, the story Dan is telling of a slow yet constant and sustainable growth over time is one that, on a different note, I am also trying to take with this podcast. A bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, You can head over to mindsbehindmaps.com to find all the previous show notes, as well as a forum if you ever want to reach out. You can also follow me or the podcast on Twitter to stay up to date with new releases. That's at Max Lunnerman for myself and at Minds Behind Maps for the podcast. With all of that said, here is my conversation with Dan Pallone. Hi Dan, um, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot for uh, for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, as you probably know, I like asking the same questions, uh, the same question, sorry, every single time. So we'll we'll start with there. Um, could you please, or how would you describe yourself, actually? Yeah. So uh, my name is Dan Pallone. I am co-founder, CEO, and CTO of Element eighty four. Um, my background is actually on the computer science side of things and so have kind of, uh, originally, and so have worked my way over to the geospatial side as we've kind of expanded what we offer and and what we do. So, um, co-founded the company with my wife, which always adds kind of a neat, uh, twist to the whole discussion about how Element 84 works. Uh, but that's my background. And, uh, let's go there then. Like one of the things I was actually quite curious is. I, I didn't know that Ele- Element 84 is, is like has been going on for quite some time. So how about we start with how things were when you guys started that? Can you explain like when you started it? What was the environment like and why? What led you to start the company? Yeah, sure. So <sighs> before we started Element 84, um, I was pretty early on in another software development company. Um, I wasn't a founder, um, but was pretty early. Loved it. Um, we had a phenomenal culture. Um, we, things, things were rocking and rolling. Um, we eventually got acquired, spun off and reacquired and kind of that dynamic changed. And so 
it led to talking with my wife about this whole thing of like, could we create the kind of place that we wanted to work? Um, you know, could we really create a place where we worked with people we enjoyed working with on stuff that mattered? Like that was really it. That was, that was the goal of this whole thing. And um, there's urban legends of like me fleeing my phone into the snow one day and decided it, it didn't quite go down that way. But like we, we started the company and kind of only half kidding, we were either going to create the kind of place we wanted to work, we were gonna have to suck it up and get grown up jobs. And that was kind of how we went into this thinking about it. And there were, we were originally gonna be small, we weren't gonna be bigger than five people. And then, you know, you meet five people that you like and well, okay, so we'll get to 10. In 10, you get to 20 and it turns out like 20 is completely unstable from a business perspective. So you gotta get to 25. What we ran into or what we saw was that if we didn't, let the company grow. And I think that's the right way to put it. We didn't set out to build an empire or anything like that. If we didn't let the company grow, we were going to have people start careering out of the company. Um, as they progressed in their careers, they wanted to work on a bigger project. They wanted to work on, they wanted to lead a project or they wanted to work with this agency or this company or whatever it was. And my wife, Tracy, uh, my wife and I, we had to kind of shift our thinking from um, not that we didn't want to grow, but how do we grow sustainably? How do we grow and maintain the culture and keep our personality and keep what made Element 84, Element 84? So um, the upside of that is that let us, we, we, kind of the glass half full version of this was like, okay, well, this lets us take on bigger projects. This lets us have a bigger impact. It can make a bigger dent by letting the company grow as long as we can grow sustainably. So um, here we are, we're, we're coming up on 12 years old now and um, we're, we're, we hit the 60 mark and uh, 60 people mark and, and kind of still going forward. Um, but the shift, we had to mentally shift and we had to kind of restructure some things internally to like let us grow sustainably and keep that culture piece going. Right. First of all, can you like explain what you guys are doing right now? And then we can go back to like how it started from the business point of view. Yeah, yeah. Like what we're doing, like what does Element 84 offer? Yeah, if you were to yeah. like summarize or, or describe what, like for a company, what does the, the company do basically? Yeah, yeah. No, so we should start with that, right? That was, uh, that'd be a good one to talk about. So um, uh, we are largely a geospatial software engineering firm. And uh, I say largely because um, we, we're a cloud software engineering firm doing large scale systems, whether it's large scale because of um, massive amounts of data or um, massive amounts of users or but scalability is kind of the key piece. We started there and in the course of the company, we kept moving further and further into geospatial because it just lends itself to that. It's, it's a whole suite of problems in there. Um, and that's really where our bread and butter is. So large scale geospatial, so petabytes of data, high, large processing, um, and then there's this whole other side of the problem, which is kind of the user experience side of the problem, which is like, how do you make mm. that data usable and accessible? And so, you know, internally, the way we put this is we try to accelerate and amplify uh, projects that matter. So we, we, you know, companies and organizations and agencies and nonprofits that are doing meaningful work, uh, but don't necessarily have the internal resources or the internal expertise to figure out how to take advantage of geospatial data and remote sensing data. I'm saying geospatial in kind of the general sense, right? But remote sensing geospatial data. So our goal is how do we make them, um, how do we make this data usable for them? How do we get them the information they need to do what they do better? Um, because what they do matters so much. So whether it's researchers, um, that's like kind of the first tier, you can go up a level to where you get to people who are familiar with data, you know, kind of your, your GIS analysts at, you know, utility companies or something like that. And then you get kind of even a further step removed where now you're looking at um, groups that are doing, whether it's disaster response or um, uh, looking at, you know, water availability and, and planning and uh, migration of populations and things like that, that there's tons of remote sensing data out there that would help them understand what's going on or how to better respond or um, how to, like, what, what upcoming things they should plan for and be concerned about. Pick your, pick your thing. Um, how do we get this information to them and make this accessible and usable? Right. Did I get it right that you said you didn't start off doing geospatial and not kind of pivoted as you went? 
we we had geospatial was a piece of what we did at the beginning but we focused more on and i'll be honest this is probably my background is in computer science my background's in software engineering and software architecture and right. so it was probably a little bit of that bias from the beginning um we did we have worked with you know nasa and usgs i mean from the beginning we've worked with them for for over a decade now and um it was a piece of what we did, but we also had um, a larger presence in kind of other scalable cloud systems. So for example, in health and medicine. So like if you look at um, things like genomics and molecular data or proteomics, um, it's actually a very similar problem to the geospatial side. It's a completely different set of data um, okay. and you know, DNA sequencing and RNA. Like it's, it's a completely different set of data, but it's a massive amount of data that's difficult to move and kind of suffers from some of the problems that geospatial suffered from where you know, it, it lived under people's desks or it was <laughs> difficult to find or difficult to move um, or to, to make accessible. And there kind of weren't the big public open data um, repositories that, you know, kind of geospatial has moved into. So we had other pillars that we were kind of doing, but as we went along, um, geospatial just kind of became a bigger and bigger piece of what we did. Um, right. And we kind of grew along with that uh, kind of in that direction. So it's not exclusively what we do. We do other large scale systems for, um, you know, nonprofits and things like that, but it is the vast majority of what we do now. And what, what was the reason for, for like, it was it just circumstantial and and if so kind of what happened for it to become the main thing that that, that you're doing it was a combination of demand and interest on our side um okay we've been very fortunate that for almost the entire company we have had more work than people um and so the demand was just always there in geospatial the opportunity was there and i don't necessarily mean opportunity just in a business sense i mean it in the like we knew this was a place we could have an impact. This was a place where we could help make things better. And then when you do that and you kind of draw that line out from what's happening, like if we can make geospatial data, remote sensing data easier to use, the, cl the kinds of people that we can help, the kinds of efforts that are going on um, in all, all you know, commercial, uh, public, private, nonprofit, pick your thing. There, there's just such demand for it. It's something we can contribute to and it's a hard, set of problems um, kind of across mm. the board. And so all of that just pulled into interest. Um, and so we just kind of gravitated towards it and continue to expand out what we did. Right. And do you, because you said you've been doing this for like 12 years now, nearly 12 years. Nearly 12 years. I, I wonder what, how have the problem that you're, you've been solving changed? Because especially oh, in the man. field of like, it's very heavy on computer science. That's like one of the fields that moves the fastest. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's been awesome. So, it, it, well, it's, it's funny. All right, so let me let me take the back the it's been awesome part and say it's been mostly <laughs> awesome. There's a, there's a couple. Uh, there are times where it feels like, man, this is the same thing we've been kind of beating our heads on for a decade, uh, okay. kind of things, and sometimes that shows up. Do you have an example of of that? Yeah. So. <sighs> like metadata is, is kind of one of those examples just to be okay. honest like like discovery of data and so okay here here's the neat thing that happens particularly in geospatial is the whole time so you've got a set of data so if you go back you know whatever go back a decade go back two decades whatever the case is right you, you've got a how fast can this data be cr created processed generated surfaced etc right and it's moving around on tapes and so like there's this there's this bottleneck on how fast that data can be produced and made available and everything else so you, you kind of address those problems but the whole time you're solving those problems and you're going after those things, you know, better satellites, better instruments are being built, faster pipes from, you know, down to, to ground stations and then faster processing on the other side. Like everything's just continually getting faster and more data is getting up there. And then you start looking at like CubeSats and, um, and that, that whole space of like the commercial satellite space is opened up. And, you know, you can, it is really in the realm of possibility that you could have, you know, a university with like a, you know, graduate class and maybe some undergrads work together, put together a CubeSat, do a ride share, put this thing in orbit for, you know, $300,000, $500,000, like totally, I mean, not like, you know, you're cutting a check out of your pocket, but like totally reasonable budget. And now you're, you've got an instrument in orbit and you're collecting data. Like it has been commoditized in a good way 
just like that, which means the data has just expanded like mad. And so you're constantly chasing this like, all right, well, we solved this, but now there's an order of magnitude more data. Um, right. Like, okay, like easy concrete example. Uh, NASA's Earth observing system right now has 40 some odd petabytes, maybe 50 petabytes of data in it, right? And that represents the entire Earth observing history. There's two new missions going up, SWAT and NISAR that are going up over the next few years, they're going to take that archive from the about 50 petabytes now to about 150 petabytes. So over the next relatively you know, single digit number of years, they're going to triple the size of the holdings that they've had in earth science data prior to that. And like, it's that rapid increase. And so you get into this, like, all right, we're back here again. We can't move the data around fast enough. So now right. what, how do we deal with it? And that kind of stuff. Um, but that, I, don't, I don't want to sound like all negative. So going the other way, like on the positive <laughs> side, uh, where things have gotten, um, you know, kind of like what the interest is or why, um, it is a hard computer science problem. Um, but man, the the opportunities there are are so cool, and it does change. You know, the the stuff that was nearly impossible before, you know, now you get into cloud computing, and we can spin up you know, not infinite compute, but as much as we need, we can spin up as much storage as we need. And what's really cool is now that is accessible to groups that it wasn't before. Um, so, right, like it used to be if you wanted to do, um, you know, I want to look at this lake over time, right? I'm pulling down tons of data and I'm paying for, I'm, I'm shipping drives around and I've got to have somewhere to store it on my end, et cetera. That data, USGS makes a ton of data available sitting on AWS for free, and I can spin up a couple instances. I can do what I want to do, and I can tear them all back down at the end. And for you know, relatively low cost, you know, like normally affordable cost, I can compute on data that I never could have touched before. And that's really exciting. That's really cool. And what does that? What has that changed from a, a company point of view for for you over that period of time? So for us, what that means is that our target, so the way we think about it is we can keep moving up, um, I'm going to call them layers of abstraction, right? I can get, when we started, it was, you know, your, your federal agencies, you know, you're working with NASA or USGS or NOAA or, or uh, NSF, and, um, and there's some commercial use, but it's expensive and it's relatively hard to get to the data and, and it is relatively hard to use. As it's gotten more and more and more accessible through efforts that like NASA is doing, USG, that same group that I'm talking about, plus the introduction of commercial data, they've made it easier to get to the data. They've made it easier to find the data and easier to use the data. That means we can get to people who it's harder, that, that they never would have considered it or it would have been cost, they could never have afforded to really kind of get at some of that data. So, um, you know, take, um, if, if you talk like the United Nations looking at water um, availability around the world, like you could realistically do global water coverage now. And you can look at it and say, okay, for this area, like here, this, this is a, an area in stress, um, rainforest monitoring, uh, wildfire response, pick your thing. You know, this is a, a, that it just really wasn't achievable. It wasn't, a, it wasn't accessible to these groups. You know, disaster response is a great example. Um, you know, wildfire response, the, you know, there's, there's so much more data available now um, than there used to be. And it's much more accessible. That, that's awesome. Like that's, that's what gets us all jazzed is like, right. okay, we can go work with those groups and help them get to this stuff. And from like, you know, I'm a, I'm a data scientist the, that, that part of like the tech side as well. It's just, I love that as well. And so I'm really curious is like from the work that you've been doing, has that shifted as well towards bigger scale projects in terms of like the, the size of, of not just the data, but even the area that you can take into account. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's the, again, the, the whole idea of because of cloud, and I'm gonna have, you know, Microsoft with a planetary computer, Amazon with their open data program and the public data sets program, Amazon sustainability has a whole set of, of data sets that are made available, to, made available for sustainability purposes. Um, you know, you can, instead of having to just, you, you can do bigger areas, I'll, I'll start there, not just in terms of the geographic space, but also in terms of time. So I can look at, right. okay, I wonder what happened over the last decade. And, and I can look at all of that data. I can look, I mean, the last, you know, the last quarter century, whatever, you know, pick, pick your thing, your Landsat is going back decades worth of data. Um, 
So I can do longer time series. I can do larger areas. I can do to some extent anywhere in the world. Um, and and all of this is uh, is is totally approachable. And um, there was something else I was going to say there. You had asked about uh, kind of the data science side, but oh, I lost it. Um, it's all right. We got time. We can come back to it later. Okay. Um, but yes, I mean all of it, right? The the whole the volume of the data that I can hit and use now is um, is is dramatically better. Oh, oh, I know where I was going with that, right? So okay, then you can do right if you want to get way fancy, and there's this is like completely doable. There's this concept of tipping and queuing, right? So I can take um, I can take a, a publicly available set, like say like Sentinel coming out of the European Space Agency, to do global coverage, and I can keep an eye. I can do a global monitoring, or you know, not in a creepy way, but in a like looking at what's changing, right? But I can do you know I can say okay, hey, there's been a change in in the water level here. There's a change in forest level, whatever it is um, that I'm interested in, or there's been a storm, whatever. I can use that to then turn around and task a, a high resolution commercial satellite to get me high resolution data over this. So I have kind of the, the more granular or the, uh, the coarser grained open data to give me a long time series. And I can turn around and tap a high resolution tasked instrument to get me you know, detailed information over a particular area that I'm interested in. Um, and it's, it's all like, th this is not like, I'm not making this up I mean, you're, yeah, you're yeah, in the yeah, space, yeah. right? This is all totally doable today. It's happening today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So I want to, um, one of the things that I kind of found out, I didn't really know about, but you guys have worked with AWS, so Amazon Web Services, to put um, Sentinel-2 on their open data registry. Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, could we talk about that? Like, I'm really curious as to, like, just, you know, from the beginning, where that started. Can you actually explain, like, why that's a big deal? Because I think it's a pretty big deal. Um, yeah, yeah. And then kind of how that happened. Yeah, so, okay, um, kind of where to start with that. So uh, to be clear, so ESA, European Space Agency, right, captures um, Sentinel data. Um, it's part of the Copernicus, uh, Const or Copernicus program. Um, they make that uh, Sentinel data available. A company called Synergize takes that and processes it up to higher level, and they make it available through um, Sentinel Hub. Um, where we got involved is, uh, so one of the problems with geospatial data is kind of the locality of the data, right? It's, it's big. And so depending on where you are, um, you know, if you need a product that's hosted, one product that's hosted in one cloud provider or one region, and you want to use it with a data set that's in a different cloud provider or a different region, you're, you're in a tough spot because you have to end up moving one of them and it's expensive to move it or it's slow to try to leverage both. So um, this is a little bit in the weeds, but it, it, with AWS, US West 2 is kind of the de facto geospatial region. It's, there's nothing formal about it. It's just where most people are putting their geospatial data. So um, I'll be honest, I don't remember exactly what kicked off the initial conversation, but what we ended up with was that making Sentinel available, making Sentinel 2 data available as cloud optimized geotiff. So basically a cloud native format to make it easier to use in the cloud. Um, could we do that and then uh, put a copy of it in US West 2 so that it's publicly accessible. It's part of the, the open data program. Um, so it, it took taking the, you know, the, the source product, uh, which is in JPEG 2000 out of L Sentinel Hub, um, repackaging it into cloud optimized geotiffs and then making it available in uh, US West 2. This was talking with um, you know, kind of like Joe Flasher at the um, at uh, AWS Open Data is is kind of instrumental in or in kind of orchestrating these and kind of lining up what are the what are some of the demands and what would be valuable and so the other piece of it though is not just making the data available but how do you make it discoverable and consumable and so that takes you down this road into um, stack uh, spatio temporal asset catalogs and. How can we expose a real simple API and a set of metadata? And if, if I'm going like to no, like, let's do it. Let's terms, do it. Okay. All right. So uh, as how long do you make as you're explaining the stuff as we go, I'm fine. I'm right. happy. All right. Well, call me out if I if I just start you know babbling. Um, so the how do you, we need to expose an API, a programmatic API that lets the data to be discoverable, and then backing that is a whole set of metadata that describes it. And so as part of you know, repackaging it into COGS, 
Um, we also started, uh, we created metadata for it, created stack metadata for it, which describes the individual scenes, um, the band information, et cetera, cloud cover, all the kind of the relevant stuff you would need. And then surface that through um, what we call uh, Earth Search. There's a, a public API. You can get to it off of our um, off of elementary4.com. You can uh, you can find the Earth Search API, which is a publicly exposed stack compliant endpoint that anybody can hit. And we get I don't know fifty some odd thousand requests a day, like fifty some odd thousand searches against it a day. Um, to hit uh, all the data sets that we've indexed so far. And we're, we have not done all of what's in open data yet, but we've, we're, we're making our way through uh, different products. Um, but what that did was it then surfaced Sentinel-2 in a way that's discoverable for stack, accessible as COGS sitting in AWS. So if you spin something up in region, you know, in US West 2 uh, in AWS, you can hit the Sentinel-2 holdings and it, it continually forward processes as well. So as new scenes get added and whatnot, we continually forward process it. Um, but you can then take advantage of that. And then a lot of this ended up feeding into um, Geoscience Australia launched um, uh, Digital Earth Africa. And uh, this was feeding into some of that as well and making that data available for Digital Earth Africa. I'm not familiar with that. What is that project? So Digital Earth Africa, it's uh, it's out of actually the Cape Town region in uh, in Africa. Uh, it's, an, it's an Amazon AWS uh, region. And um, it's Open Data Cube is the underlying kind of product. And Geoscience Australia has been a, a major driver of this, and it's making available a massive set of data, a whole bunch of uh, data relevant to Africa uh, in Open Data Cube, which means these products have now been aligned, like they're, they're, ba they're able to be used together um, and, uh, and kind of aligning those products um, in a way that you can hit Open Data Cube and do, um, if you're familiar with analysis ready data, but you can basically start doing analysis and processing against a whole suite of products that are hosted in, uh, as part of right. the Digital Earth Africa effort. So let, let's go back to the, to the AWS work. One of the things sure. like I was really surprised as someone just like kind of entering the field a few years ago is kind of realizing that a lot of people say, oh, there's this Copernicus program is like this amazing thing, which it is. Um, right. there's this like sentinel, um, imagery that's free for like everybody in the world to go. And mm -hmm. then you're like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Let me go check it out. And then you go try to check it out. And you're like, what the heck? Like yeah. how, I think it took me like literally years of working in the industry before I actually understood how you could use that. Do you think like, uh, what I want to actually understand is like, what was the, kind of involvement from like that led to this and like how was isa for example who's like kind of earthing the, the project literally like how's that involvement with them for example in making that data available because i feel like that's the best thing that can happen to that data and and that, that that's probably very subjective but i feel like putting it on a bucket somewhere where you can just like in a few seconds from your terminal, like even if you don't know what you're doing, like get an image, um, that's like a leaps and bounds better than going through Sentinel Hub. I'm sorry, Isa, but it kind of sucks. Yeah, so, um, okay, so let me, let me take that, up, take a couple pieces of that. So um, the, the, I totally agree with you, right? Like open data is a huge opportunity. Um, and so, if you start there, right? So ESA is making this data available. Now the, the ESA model and the NASA model are slightly different. I, I say ESA and NASA, but other agencies. So they're, they're a little bit different. In the ESA model, they make the kind of the raw data available and then um, other groups can process it up to higher level. Uh, NASA takes a slightly different approach, which they will tend to produce slightly higher level products. They'll, they'll provide the low level data as well, but then higher level products also. Um, so you know, making that uh, for you know, Sentinel Hub is processing those up to higher level products or they're making those things available, which is which is great. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, Synergize uh, brings a ton to bear in terms of um, making that data usable, um, you know, cloud processing and everything else. There's a lot of, of really great layers that are being put on top of the raw Sentinel data. Um, but ultimately, you know, how to get to that data depending on your use case and sometimes just geographically where you are, there's different benefits. Like there's, there's, there's different ways you want to do it. There's different ways to get there. Um, 
And so um, I agree that right now the accessibility of data is, is so much better than it's ever been. And so you see groups like, I'm gonna go back to NASA and USGS again, like they're making that transition, they're pushing that data out. And even more so, uh, NASA has gone even one step further beyond, they have an open data policy and they make their data available and it's free to consume. It's even free to pull down, like they, you, know, you can, you can ex exfil it from the DAX or from AWS and, um, and there's, there's no charge to you to get to that data. Um, they're going even further into what um, kind of the, the new initiative they launched is called open source science, which is not just making the data available, but making all the processing algorithms, making all of the tooling that they're, they're using to, um, to exploit that data and, um, and process it up and, and take advantage of it. They're making all of that available as well, too. And so that's another major place like as element 84 that we contribute to, you know, the, the open source tooling environment and um, the you know, whatever it is, whether it's like automated processing. So I'll come back to that in a second. I want to talk about automated processing for a second because I think that's a little bit underserved. Um, but uh, you know, talking about kind of the discovery pieces, the use pieces, um, you know, the, the the Python tooling, just basic Python tooling to be able to, like you said, from a terminal or from a command line, to be able to just hit a bunch of data that's sitting in the cloud, and um, it's it's dramatically better than it ever was. Uh, I don't think it's done by any stretch, right? Like if you still, so here's a little soapbox that we used to get on inside the company, and it probably is still true. Um, several years ago, a number of years ago, NASA put out a solicitation calling for um, you know, input on how could they make data science better or you know, make using the data better. And in the solicitation, they put out that the typical data scientist, the typical NASA researcher spends about 60% of their time preparing the data and 30% uh, of the time actually, do, actually doing the research, right? I mean, you, you, know, you have a data science background. I'm sure you've, you've struggled through this, right? The data wrangling and everything else that goes with it. Um, that's awful, right? Like just, just put that in any other field, right? Like if you are a doctor and you spend 60% of your time, you know, getting ready to go see patients for 30% of your time, or, um, you know, pick anything, right? If you sat down as a developer and you spent two thirds of your day getting your machine, maybe, maybe some people do that, but you know, you spend two thirds of your day getting your machine ready for the, the third of the day that you're actually productive. So this became like this internal soapbox rant for us um, at Element 84. And it was like, if we could just have the time that it spends, fight, that people spend fighting with data, you could double the amount of science being done without having to change a dollar in the budget. You could just double the, the amount of science. So that's what a lot of these things drive towards. Like that data accessibility makes it easier. I don't have the, the barrier to get to the data. The tooling is better than it was, but it's still hard. And then I'll pull this back to the beginning of our conversation um, where we talked about, um, you know, kind of approach or, you know, instruments getting more mature and things like that. So now if you look at products like synthetic aperture radar, um, that's hard to use, like just straight up SAR data is, is difficult to deal with. It's big, it's computationally intensive and it's complicated, it's complex. So that's a case where, you know, some of the basic products have gotten more easy to use um, or gotten easier to use. And then uh, new instruments have gone up that have just raised the bar again. And so now it's like, okay, so now we got to come back and, and uh, all right, we got to circle back and figure out how to make this data more accessible and usable. Um, I mentioned the the computing and the processing thing. Um, I there because of the accessibility of more data, automation of computing and processing is now becoming more important to a typical person um, or a, a typical user of the data. Um, right? How do I do this? Okay, great. I can I can use QGIS or I can use some you know GDAW with Python and I can I can go at some of this stuff myself. But like if I want to do this whole area or if I want to continually watch this area or I want to see this area over time, um, that's a hard uh, it it just you kind of get down into the weeds. Um, AWS talks about undifferentiated heavy lifting. It's not quite that, but it's similar to that. So um, what you're starting to see now, which I think is awesome, um, is the availability of more tools to make it easier for um, a non-agency user. So, you know, not, uh, not your large scale processing that like a DAC might do or a, a SIPS might do for NASA, um, but how can a lab do it or a researcher with a couple of grad students, um, how can they do continual processing and things like that? And so you start to see things or how do they do it across a lot of data? 
So you start to see things like Dask and X-Array and, um, and at L94, we launched a project um, with, uh, as part of a NASA access grant initially, and we've kept it going called Cirrus, which is um, basically that, that kind of medium to low scale processing. Like you're, you're not looking to necessarily reprocess and the entire NASA holdings, but I want to continue monitoring over this area and process new data as it's acquired and do change detection or whatever it is I'm doing. And I can kind of automate that workflow. And so now you're seeing tools coming out that make that possible, which is awesome. This is pretty interesting. Like, I think I'd like to stay there a little bit. Can we go sure. like how, I'm curious how you think about tools like Dask and X-Ray that they dramatically help automate and scale up the Mm -hmm. the pipelines that we build. Um, Pangeo, from a, I should put Pangeo in that bucket. Yeah. Too. Um, yeah, yeah. So these are tools that they basically allow you to uh, chunk data um, mm -hmm. a lot easier and then multi-process a lot mm -hmm. of data all at once, which is yep. pretty hard to do natively in Python. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious as to what you think, like if we push that, a little bit further what do you think that looks like down the line if we you know maybe go like down the computer science path for a little bit here on a tangent what do you think it looks like do you think we're moving away from from python and gdal kind of how it's done today towards more and more abstraction layers maybe like that or, or something different um no i don't um i think that uh well that's that's, that's too blank of an answer I think you have, I think they're kind of two different levels of things, right? Like, so you have like right. you know, GDAL as your tooling or something like that. And I, and under the hood of like almost any uh, geospatial anything, at some point, if you, you know, you dig deep enough, you're going to find somebody running GDAL at the bottom. Like that's, that's just the, and, and there's a lot of validity to that, right? These algorithms, the, the, the code in, in GDAL or, or Google for, so like you don't get complaints of people saying I'm pronouncing it wrong, but um, for, uh, the, you know, those algorithms, that implementation has been vetted and validated and works and is reliable and is consistent. And so everybody using it is running the same thing against the code, right? So that's a that's a major piece of that. And there's a lot of validity in that. Re-implementing all of those things is a non-trivial. So is it kind of like GDAL is the COBOL of geospatial? Do you kind of see it like that? I think there's a little bit of that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think GDAL has, uh, has been doing a good job. Like the maintainers of GDAL have been a good job of continually evolving it. Like, you know, it supports COGS and it support, you know, pick your thing, um, MRF and things like that um, as it continues to improve or continues to evolve. So I don't think it's like stuck. I would maybe a little bit more like Fortran kind of like at the end of the day, right. You're getting down to like, I have, a hard set of processing, like mathematical processing that's going to be done against, or, you know, the, the algorithmic processing that has to get done against this data. And this is an implementation that we all use and we all agree on and it's been validated and it's vetted and everything else. So, okay. So that piece, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. And then at the other end, um, you know, maybe you'll get to like at the at kind of the other end of like the user end of things, like maybe you'll get to, um, you know, user interfaces and things like that. We can talk about that and kind of what that user experience looks like on top of this data, but the, um, but from a, you know, is, is it going to replace Python or anything like that? You still need some way to express what you want to do to this data. Um, you know, whether you're doing it in R or you're doing it in Python or whatever, it, it's, it's kind of immaterial. Um, it's, you, you need some way to express what you want to do to this data. Um, I think where things like Dask and X-Ray um, and, um, and honestly, cloud computing and cloud optimized geotiffs and cloud optimized point clouds and all this other stuff where these things fit in is um, is now taking giving you the ability as the as the analyst or the data scientist to express what you want to do and then these tools sit in the middle to take advantage of low level things like GDAL to then do it at a scale that was previously unreachable for you and so i think that so like a, a, okay a very standard workflow um if you're really doing kind of like automated processing of things so you have some processing workflow framework like cirrus uh that, that's what we would use most of the time um you have some kind of processing workflow that maybe it's doing data ingest um metadata generations other things like that but it's creating your geospatial data lake or you're using somebody else's geospatial data lake um 
but you have you have that kind of thing running, and then what you have sitting next to it is you know Jupiter Lab or um, you know Jupiter Hub um, or Pangeo sitting there that's able to hit that data, hit that geospatial data lake that your your that all of your stuff is sitting in, and then you're using Python or something along those lines to iterate through an algorithm to develop, okay, here's, here are the questions I want to ask. Here's how I process it to get that. Here's how I want to visualize that data to see my results. I want to see my time series plotted. You know, here's the data I'm using. Here's the corrections I have to apply to it. Here's the masking I'm doing to it. And that's a whole other space of stuff that should be easier, but whatever. Um, and then eventually like, okay, here's the information I'm ultimately interested in, plot that over time or give it to me as a heat map over top of something else, whatever. Um, okay, cool. That works. Now, ideally, you can say, all right, now take that and I want you to run that against the entire Landsat time series. I want to run this over. I want to see what this looks like over the last 20 years of data, or I want to see what this looks like over this entire continent um, or, or pick your thing. That's where this set of tooling drops in. Um, and then when you marry that up with Elastic Compute in the cloud, now I can spin up a ton of resources and I can do, instead of it grinding for weeks or months, I can run this in parallel and I can get it done in an hour or two hours or eight hours, kind of whatever I'm willing to pay for. Um, I can, I can run it that way. And that's where this whole suite of tooling falls in. So do you, do you see it moving towards people learning to use those directly more than the underlying layers that are underneath? Yeah. I think it depends on who the people are you're talking about, but so, yes, yeah, I think what that I mean the... is like data scientists, just people using trying to answer questions like from whatever data. Yep. Yes. I think that for your, your data scientists, yeah, I think they're going to move to a higher level. I mean, ultimately like this is just the trend of everything in computer science and geospatial and remote sensing data is just another, it's another branch of that. Right. Um, that uh, you're just always moving up a level of abstraction. You're, you're getting more capabilities. You're getting and And the lower level details of how to do it, get abstracted away so you don't have to worry about it. And you can think more um, at the level of what is my actual question that I'm trying to ask? And uh, and what do I need to answer that question? How you get there gets automated over and over and over again. And um, and so, yeah, I think you're gonna get, you're gonna move up the stack, like the, the data analysts are gonna move up the stack. And the nice thing is that what that does is it also pushes more towards users that are further removed. So you get users who are, you know, even less familiar with geospatial data. And not only do they not know GDAL, but they probably don't know Dask or Xray. Right? And that's what like, you know, you can now expose to them more interactive, you know, GUI based stuff um, where they can focus on asking and answering the questions that they care about. And then behind the scenes, there's a lot of that's been abstracted away. Right. I want to take a bit of a, like, go somewhere else. Um, one of the things I was actually quite curious is to understand, if we go back to what we were talking about on the work that you've done for AWS, I'm actually quite curious as to like who paid for that? Because it feels like it's this free data that's uh, available, like it's done, like as you were saying, NASA, ESA um, takes care of those, but then those are freely available at the end. So this is probably a naive question but i still wanted to ask it like what's no, no, the business great... model behind doing something like that yeah it's a it's a totally fair question um and it's a, it's a great question it's an important question because there's always a lot of stuff of like oh it'd be great if i could do x y or z but the reality is somewhere that like somebody has to pay yeah. for whatever it is you're trying to do right so okay so there's a different um i'll kind of hit different ones so in the case of nasa um like the nasa eos holdings that i was talking about um, those, as they transition to AWS, uh, that's, that's a NASA effort, right? So if you pull data down from a NASA DAC, if you pull data down from, if you pull NASA data down from NASA's holdings in AWS, that's all being, uh, paid for and, and maintained by NASA. Um, AWS has a different program, um, or another program. They have a program called, um, the AWS open data program. And in the case of the open data program, um, they cover the costs of making that data available for free. Um, their business model, and I, I, I can't speak for them, but I, I don't, I'm not going out on a limb here, right? Their business model is if you make that data available and easy, as, as easy as possible to get to on AWS, then what that does is that draws, you move the compute to the data 
And that draws people in to then start using AWS services, right? I'm paying for my, my we talked about Dask and X-Ray, right? My, my Dask cluster is running in AWS because that's sitting right next to the petabytes of data that, NAS, that AWS has made available um, or NASA, whatever the case may be. But so that's kind of the, the approach um, from the AWS side, open data they cover um, they, they expose and, and pay for, and then you pay for the compute to take advantage of it if you're sitting next to it. Um, when you get to the Sentinel pieces, uh, like the stuff that we did, it varies. Um, in some cases, there are uh, there might be a commercial um, entity that wants access to a product and they'll pay us to, to do whatever, you know, to do the processing or product generation or higher level processing or whatever it may be. Um, they'll pay us to do that. Uh, in the case, in some cases, well, we cover that um, as kind of a contribution back to the community. So, for example, um, we're heavily involved in uh, the Stack community um, implementations like Stack Server. Um, we make Cirrus open source. Um, we, we like there's a there's a number of things we've kind of thrown out um, into the open source world that we use internally and maintain. Um, or you know that, that we use regularly, uh, but we contribute it back out to open source. Um, we feel like there's a little bit of a, like, honestly, we feel like there's a little bit of an ethical obligation, uh, like going back to the GDAL thing, right? Like we're sitting on top of GDAL for a lot of the stuff that we do. And like, how can we, you know, we're, we're leveraging these tools. Like we need to contribute back. Like we need to help advance the whole thing. Yeah. I was going to ask about that. Like what's the, what's the um, rationale or reasoning from, from even like a, a business point of view about like you're building all these pipelines and, and why putting them, open source behind because it feels like it's a um from a bit of a game theory point of view maybe it kind of feels like it works as long as everybody plays along yeah and it's surprising that everybody's playing along in a way <laughs> so yeah that's why i'm kind of curious to ask about that as well okay there's a bunch of different dimensions to this so <laughs> Um, Again, sorry, we've got okay, time. To, you ask these questions and I'm like, all right, here, hold on, because we're going to talk for a couple minutes. All right, so um, let's do it. The uh, Okay, so there's a couple different pieces. Um, on the altruistic side, right, there's a, I, I think there is kind of a, a moral piece of, you know, realistically, it would be, I think, impossible to build any piece. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I think maybe it would, it's a fair statement. It would be impossible to build any piece of software right now and you're not leveraging some piece of open source, like full stop, right? And so there's a piece of this from a business perspective, like a, a business ethics perspective that at Element 84, we feel like we're building on top of all of these great things that other people have contributed to um, that like we have an, a moral obligation to contribute back and support some of these things. So like we put aside money on, in our annual budget for open source work, like it's just, we're gonna just contribute back and keep it advancing these things. So there's that aspect of it. There's also the aspect of some of these things only work, like to your point about game theory, like some of these things only work if we all agree to, to use them. So for example, like take stack, right? Or, or OGC APIs or, or pick your thing, right? They only work, they're only valuable if, if I, if everybody is using them or a, or a significant portion of them are using them. Like if we can get all everybody to agree on stack as the metadata standard we're going to use, well then awesome. All of our tools get better. Even in-house proprietary stuff all gets better because you now have uh, many more data providers that are using it. And so if we're all going to agree that this is what we should use as our standards, then like, why not all pull resources instead of all of us having to build it individually, let's all pull this together and we'll contribute to an open source version that we all share. Um, because then it's a multiplier for everybody involved. Um, so that's another kind of dimension. Um, then from a purely business perspective, right? And this is a little bit of a philosophical view, but from our side, when we're talking about things like geospatial data lakes or um, you know, remote sensing process, remote data processing and, and all that kind of stuff. If we're working with a customer and we have long relationships with our customers. We don't usually do like short term projects. We, we're, we're generally not structured for like come into a one or two month or three month engagement and, and boogie out. Um, we want like multi-year relationships. Um, we have customers where we are their entire engineering team. Um, they, they do the business side they, and all that. They are completely transparent with us. Like, look, here's our roadmap. Here's our, here's how profitability works. Like here's how the whole thing they, and, and we are their, engineering team we provide you know almost like cto level consult like we work with them hand in hand over years and year long multi year long roadmaps so in that model trust is is absolutely vital 
as well as if you're that company, there's a risk factor, right? There's a risk mitigation factor that if I'm the other company, if I'm one of our customers, I can't have my company, I can't have our success dependent on Element 84 continuing to be there or continuing to maintain the thing that they're doing or whatever mm. it is. Like I can't stra- I can't just rely that I'm going to, that, that my whole company will fail if this other one fails, right? Like that's, you just, as a responsible CEO, like you can't, you can't absorb that kind of risk. Right. And so from our side, the, the way we can mitigate that risk with, with our customers is we say, look, like we're going to build you open source solutions. And if at the end of the day, you're not happy with us, if we're not providing value or just realistically, you don't need us anymore, right? Like you've, we, we've done the things you needed done. You're, you're cruising along and like, okay, we're, we're good now for a while, whatever it is, you can walk away. You can take this to somebody else. You can move it in-house. You can run it yourselves. And there's a, like, it's a philosophical difference from saying like, nope, you're paying a license fee. You're locked into me. Like you, you're going to be paying this forever. Um, we don't take that approach. And instead, um, I kind of want to sound all like, you know, high and mighty here, but like from our side, the way we approach it is like the challenge for us then is we have to continually provide value. We have to, it forces us to continually innovate and drive things forward because as things get commoditized, if we just keep doing the same thing we're doing, if we keep selling the same thing that we're selling, eventually it's going to be commoditized. And so instead, let's commoditize it ourselves. Let's make it as open source. It reduces a risk from the client side because they can take that software and find somebody else to support it if they need to. And we focus on making sure that we just keep raising that bar as we go forward. Yeah. So what I'm really curious is I I like what you said about this is not like there's no we're not going to do like lock you down and have a licensing fee um, that you have to pay forever because otherwise you're screwed. Uh, Maybe this is is also like a a naive take on it, but I feel like that's pretty common in the geospatial world compared to other worlds. If you go to uh, I'm thinking like music production, for example, or anything related to video. Like it feels like Adobe, for example, has this huge grip on people where it's like, you're going to have to pay this forever to get access to these things. They're a bit, they're different fields like that, but it feels like in geospatial, at least from what I've seen, there's a bunch of companies that are working like that where there's, because there's enough players that are contributing to open source, there's no incentive for you to come as a newcomer and say, all right, we're gonna lock you down in a licensing fee um, and make it that you can never go away. Because if someone comes with that, whatever customers is gonna go to the next company that's building them open source as well. First of all, do you feel like you're seeing the same thing? And second, why do you think that is the case if the answer to question one is yes? (laughs) Sure. Um, I, I think it's a little more nuanced than that. Um, and, Mm -hmm. and I don't want to hate on commercial software at all. Like there are absolutely places for it, but I think that, I think one of the video is, is potentially in this space. Um, video is, is also large, but so for example, take, if you, you brought up Adobe, so take like Photoshop, right? If I'm doing image editing, um, it may absolutely be worth it for me. Like say, um, now I'm like, I'm not trying to hate on open source either, but like if I'm going to try to do my image editing with like GIMP uh, versus doing my image editing with Photoshop, I am far more productive in Photoshop. Like that is just a far more sophisticated uh, you know, capability. Like there are, there are things where it is worth it for me to pay. Like it, it's just a trade, right? I'm willing to pay money to get more of my time back or get a more sophisticated set of whatever. And so in that case, but, you know, and so ultimately, but at some point I can say, you know what, I'm, I'm not using Photoshop anymore. I'm going to whatever, but my images and everything I've been working on still is there. I haven't lost my, like the, the cost of moving tooling is like a training cost, but not necessarily a, right. Um, right, right. but it's, it's somewhere in that space. And, I, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying because if you've got like video production pipelines and everything else, like I, I'm, I'm definitely oversimplifying, but I think that in geospatial, there's there's kind of two major factors in my mind that drive this. One is the vo- the size of data, right? It, it's complex and it's it's a lot of data. And so if I take a, if I pay for something where I am putting data into it um, and I have to pay a license in order to keep doing the thing I'm doing, 
getting back out of that could be cost prohibitive. And now I'm stuck. And, and it's, it's a massive amount of, it's, it's very, very difficult. It's not just a human, you know, skill set retooling. Um, it's a, it's, it's could be cost prohibitive. And this is something like, for example, we talk about, um, this is at elementary four, we'll have conversations around like vendor lock-in with cloud providers, right? And we have great relationship with the cloud providers. I have nothing, I have nothing but great things to say, but there's a, always a discussion of like vendor lock-in. Like, do you build natively, you know, do you, do you build to native AWS services or native Azure services, or do you go like a Kubernetes route and everything's generic and I can move it to any cloud, I'm cloud agnostic and all that kind of stuff or on-prem. Um, what I feel like isn't talked about quite as much is the data side of it. Like the reality of it is if I needed to move this piece of software and I needed to re-implement it, I could do it. Like, I mean, it might, might not be fast, it might not be cheap, but like I could do it. If I've got 40, 50, 100 petabytes of data in cloud vendor A and I need to get out fast, there is not a cheap, fast way to do that. And it could be cost prohibitive to move that data back out and put it somewhere mm, else. And right. so I think that changes the dynamic a little bit when talking about some of the geospatial stuff of where do I, like, how do I, where do I hedge? And so if you, you know, again, leveraging open source solutions for geospatial, and again, I'm not trying to downplay their value I, they're like you know take esri um you know, or esri right with with the arcgis there is such a user base out there for arcgis and there are so many things that it does and does yeah, well yeah, yeah. I, i'm not sitting here saying like oh you shouldn't use it like no no like use the right tool for the job but when you look at it from a risk perspective a lot of times the right tool for the job might be open source because you've got to mitigate a set of a set of risks um, and then the other piece I would put in kind of the other dimension, that's, that's like the first part of it. And the other dimension is that communal part of it, right? Like I need, you know, uh, if I want to use Landsat and Sentinel together, if I want to use Grace uh, for water values and I want to use SAR data for land sublimation, if I've got to use these different products and I want to use some Capella SAR data for something and I want to use some planet uh, optical data for something, whatever, um, I want those all to agree, right? I need those things to all kind of be operating. I need to be able to put those products together somewhere or have a set of tools that can work across all of them. And I think that pushes you back into a community model more so than a proprietary one, because otherwise everybody has to build their own version of each of these things to work with everybody else. And it just doesn't, that's a harder problem. Right. Yeah. I see what you mean. Oh, that's such an interesting way of seeing it. This is great because I hadn't considered it like that. So yeah, no, I I, I like it. This is why I love these conversations because it just shows me things in a, in a in a different way. All right, let's let's move on to something else then. Um, one of the interesting things that you mentioned at the very beginning and that that we said we'd talk about is the um, aspect of co-founding Element eighty four with your wife. Mm -hmm. um, that's not something you hear all the time. And so I'm really curious if we can go a little bit there, kind of what, how that happened and like how it's been going. Cause it's a bit of a, um, yeah, I think not very common situation. And I, I'm very curious as to yeah, how that has gone um, and just your experience on it. Yeah, sure. Um, um, so I, I don't usually, you know, usually we don't talk about this, not like that we're trying not to talk about it, but um it's come up recently a bunch. And so uh, if you were to ask her, I think she would tell you that um, I kind of talked her into this. Um, when we started Element 84, uh, I was going to do, you know, kind of the technical work. She was going to handle kind of, you know, insurance contracts, that kind of stuff. She has her MBA um, from Georgetown and like, that's her side of, that. that's her sweet spot. Um, and then as we progressively gotten bigger and bigger, obviously both of our responsibilities have grown. So um, it's been, overall, it has been excellent. Um, and I don't, I honestly don't know how I could do it differently. Um, and, and here's why. Building a company, starting a company, anybody who's, who's done that, um, it's, it's time consuming, it's hard work. Um, and this isn't like a, I, I'm not complaining about it. Like, it's just the reality of it is like, there's just, you know, there's, you're, you're responsible at the end of the day for what happens and you're responsible for the decisions. At the same time, you've got to empower other people and kind of delegate that stuff out and everything else. Um, but it takes a lot of time and to be able to do that, my wife's name is Tracy, and, and to be able to do that with her 
is so much better than not doing that with her, right? Like it's something that we can all be in. Um, you know, my my kids are involved. Um, like they, you know, they they have the shirts, and uh, my oldest, we have we have a we don't take um, we don't do interns below college level. But uh, when my oldest started college, like he interned at at when he graduated high school, he interned at elementary four for in computer science, um, and to be able to sink into it and it be something that we work on together and we succeed together and celebrate victories together is awesome. Like, and it would be, I just don't think I could be as committed to it. I don't think that it would be the same if I was doing it with some other people because um, you, it, there's a, you, it's a harder to balance, right? It's something that we can work on together. It's, I don't want to say it's a hobby as a family, but like it's something that we're invested in together and we can work on together. That's awesome. The downside is like when something doesn't go right, like when there is a problem, it's hard to separate from that, right? Like it's hard to um, to just leave it at the door and uh, um, and and come home and you know, well, I'll deal with that tomorrow because it's it's bothering both of us, right? Like it's it's there. So we learned we had to set up a bunch of rules in the house. Um, it is, uh, it's not uncommon that if like, we're both sitting on the couch at night, uh, you know, watching TV or whatever that like, I will pick up my phone and like email her or something that like popped into my head rather than saying it out loud, because like, it's just not fair at 10 o'clock to be like, Oh, did we sign the whatever, you know, or you know, where do you hear this? Like, so you, you kind of have to like, we had to set up rules for that kind of stuff, um, to kind of separate those. Um, the the single biggest thing uh, that so we have we have an outside um, group that we brought in um, the, the company's named Kaizen um, that uh, has been fantastic kind of from an executive coach perspective and a culture perspective and things like that and they they have been absolutely wonderful I, I can't speak highly enough for them um, but with their help we as we got bigger as Element eighty four got bigger we put in place a leadership team. Um, and we lean on that leadership team all the time and they are absolutely wonderful. Um, and that was huge because it took some of that off of just being Tracy and I, um, and it gives us an outside perspective. Um, one more thing I'll hit on here that I think is really important, um, and is kind of a weird consequence because sometimes you get, some people are saying like, oh, well, if it's a husband and wife team. Like what happens if you have a problem with one of them? And like, how do you, how do you deal with that? Or, you know, are they, um, you know, is, is that going to go sideways? So uh, Tracy and I regularly disagree about things. Like that's just part of, um, we're, we're both comfortable with that. And, um, and we come at things from a different perspective. I am very much, uh, I am very risk tolerant. Um, I am very much the, like, how hard could it be? Like, let's like, we got this and we'll figure it out. Um, and she is not, uh, she is generally much more risk averse. Um, and she is much more methodical and you need both of these things. Like, to be clear, we, we, we talk about it, uh, balloon in the string. I'm the balloon, she's the string. And like, if you didn't have both of them together, like bad things would happen. So um, they, but what that means is that we will frequently disagree, not frequently, but like we will, there's, we're not concerned if we disagree with something. So what that's turned into is that we'll do that at the company. I mean, respectfully, we're not like yelling at each other down the hall or anything goofy, but um, like we will, we will disagree. And I think what that has translated into is a comfort level inside of the company of disagreeing with things as well. And like, how do you resolve those disagreements? And you do it in a, you know, you do it in a meaningful way. And ultimately at the end, we're going to have to make a decision. And even if that, if it wasn't your preferred outcome, like, okay, now we're all going to get behind it and go forward. And so I think kind of the weird consequence of Tracy and I having a, a dynamic that works that way has kind of given other people in the company permission to, to disagree and, and come back to, to either or one of us and say like, I completely disagree with this thing. Can we talk through it? And then we can all argue about it and, and then come to a, a much better solution than if we had not had that conversation. Right. So it's, it's translating that as well in a way where that becomes something a part of the culture of the company yep. to be able to to raise those disagreements yep. talk about it go through it and, and just compromise basically at the end. right right at the end of the day we're all going to get through this at the end of the day we're going to come up with something and like yep we're, we're disagreeing but this isn't like oh my gosh like we're just, like if you know and what i learned about myself is um I need that. Like I have to, I, I, you know, sometimes you hear about like, you know, you get yes people on your team and they just say, yeah, like I would fail 
epically if I had a if I was surrounded by a bunch of yes people. Our director of engineering, um, I mean, she'll she'll call me out without a moment's hesitation, and that's wonderful. Like I I need that. Um, that counterpoint. I, I learned that that's how I think through things. I learned that that's how I process ideas. Um, sometimes I'll play devil's advocate just to argue the other side and have them argue with me. Uh, and then at the end of that, I'm like, yep, what you're saying is, is what I thought we needed to do. And like, and now you've convinced me that's what we have to do because you, you know, you did a great job of arguing that side of it. So that whole dynamic. Um, and like I said, I, I think that because Tracy and I can function that way, um, made it okay as part of the culture that we right. can all function that way. So I want to spend some time on, on like growing the, the company and creating the team that you have today and the culture. Um, one of the things that I found quite interesting that you said at the very beginning was that, um, one of the reasons for growing, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, let me know if that's not what you said, but was that you wanted to have room for people to grow in the company as well. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they would kind of outgrow the company, I think is the term mm -hmm. that, that you might have used. Um, again, with the naive questions, why is that a problem? Like, why would that, why would they're having like, I guess, turnover where it's just like, those are not the people that are needed anymore, for example, in the company. And then you bring in other people. Why would that be a problem in, in leading you to, to want to also keep people? I'm, as I'm saying that, it feels like super cold of a question, but I'm actually No, legit no, it's a curious. fantastic question. No, it's absolutely a fantastic question. Um, okay, so we refer to it as careering out, right? We don't, we don't want people to career out of the company. Um, I want to say that like for some people, like the right answer, depending on where they are in their career, um, the right answer might be, you know, no, like this, this isn't a great fit. You know, you should go do something else. Um, we have had people that left the company and come back. Uh, and they're okay. totally, totally reasonable. Like they wanted to go do something else. They went there and they're like, no, I really like this over here. And they come back. That's, that's totally fine. Um, what's funny is we actually frequently have some of the hardest time hanging on to junior people uh, more so than senior people. Um, because they don't have the breadth of experience, right? They want to go try something else. They want to go, they're early in their careers, right? They're still trying to figure things out. So that, that's fine. Like we, like we, I, I remember, um, so we have, you know, going away parties for people who are leaving and uh, we had hired somebody new. I, I honestly don't remember who it was that said this, but the, like on their first day, we were having a going away party for somebody else. And they're like, like they were clearly uncomfortable. And they talked to us afterwards. They're like, that is just so wild, like where they had come from. And I don't remember where they came from, but whatever company they had come from, like if someone quits, like they just kind of quietly disappear and like nobody talks about it. And i um, like, no, like, you know, I, I want I want people to pursue their passions and do what they want. I, I hope they're at Element 84. Like, I, I hope that's where they want to pursue their passions. Um, but, you know, they need to be excited and passionate and enjoy what they do and they need to find the right niche for them. And sometimes it's not just not the right time um, you know, or they, or they'll come back or whatever, but that's not, that wasn't, that's just like an aside. I want to be clear about that. Um, to your point about why let the company grow or anything like that, or kind of why worrying about careering out. So there's a couple of different pieces of this. One is culture. This is, I'm, I'm going to totally quote, um, Kaizen, the group that I mentioned before they, they talked to Tracy and I about this when they first came in. So much of culture is, employees seeing how decisions are made um, and what those decisions are at, it, at the moment, right? So when something actually happens to a company or, or when, when a company's you know, doing something and makes a decision about, we're going to do this, we're going to introduce this benefit, we're going to take this project, we're going to get rid of this project, whatever it is, um, those decisions are ultimately what make, and how those decisions are made are ultimately what makes up the culture of a company. And so you have a set of institutional knowledge um, of people that have stayed with the company because they, they like the way decisions are made. They become part of that culture, right? There's an institutional knowledge in them. They've been through this. They've seen it. And they're going to model that when they make decisions. And so to have someone leave because they want a different culture or a different environment or a different whatever, okay, totally, that, that's no problem. To have someone leave because these projects just aren't challenging enough 
um, and they want to um, they want to work on a bigger project or they want to work with this particular technology. I mean, within reason, you know, if they want to go like write names on rice, that's a different problem. But like if they want to, uh, you know, but if it's like I wanted I want some ML expertise, um, I want an exam an opportunity to work on a machine learning project. Um, if that's something that we that's in our wheelhouse. I would so much rather figure out how to give them that opportunity at Elementary 4 and retain all of the culture and the spirit and the energy and the historical knowledge and everything else that this person has. I mean, at the end of the day, it's the people that make up the company and make up the culture. And so if you're rolling them over um, because they reach a certain point in their career, then there's a certain amount of stagnation that the company suffers from a maturity perspective. You don't have that long view in the company anymore um, to, to help steer it forward. Right. And so moving from there, like how have you approached bringing in new people in, in the company? Like I'm guessing that's also changed over time. Yeah, it's sure it has. Um, I, and I guess I, one other thing I have real quick, I think go back for half a second. Here. Yeah, sure. The, um, you had mentioned about like versus, you know, what if there, if you, you need different people now than you needed then. Um, I think there's absolutely uh, some truth to that, right? Like as, a, as you, as a company grows, as it changes, as the environment changes, you want to introduce new blood, new ideas, new skill sets, right? So you need to be bringing in stuff too. Um, the other thing is that as the company grows, if you let the company grow, um, like, okay, here, like here's kind of a, a relatively easy way to, to think of this or kind of see how you get here. Let's say we have three, whatever, senior developers who are or senior engineers who are phenomenal and, um, and they all have aspirations to be an architect on a project or a chief architect or a technology, a technical leader or whatever. Do you really want to lose two of them because you only have space for one? Like, no, I, I, I want, I'd love to have the, right. I want the whole company to be phenomenal people who are all on their way to do great things. So then it becomes incumbent on Tracy and I and the rest of the leadership team to basically grow those opportunities. Like if we can get bigger, well, now we need more chief architects or right. more chief technologists right. or whatever, pick your thing, directors of X, Y, or Z, or now we can introduce a cloud practice and we can introduce a dedicated geospatial practice. And we can introduce a dedicated machine learning practice. And now we need somebody who can lead that up. And like, you know what, I've got this whole crop of really talented, capable people that are all looking for their next challenge. And if you don't grow that, you lose just this great group of people that rightfully want to continue to level up and take on harder problems. That sounds like such an interesting approach to growth. It, it, it feels like, and maybe this is just because that's what we talked about, but it, it kind of feels like a, a, a um, how do I put it? It's like a people focused growth. Yes. Absolutely. 150%. Um, we, we joke. Uh, so Tracy and I, we have no outside invest, like we don't take any venture capital or anything like that. We don't have any outside investment, right? So we're a privately held company. It's just Tracy and I, and then um, some internal uh, shares and things like that. But um, Tracy and I will joke sometimes like, man, the shareholders are going to be pissed about X, Y, or Z, uh, you know, whatever this thing is. Um, but we have always backed into growth. We have never said we want to grow 30% this year, figure out how we've never come at it that way. We've always come at it the other direction, which is like, we want to do X, Y, or Z, or we have people who want to do this. All right, where does it go? This project has an opportunity to grow. Here's a, an agency we want to work with. Here's an area we want to get into. All right, how do we do it? Um, and then internally, you know, we want people to everybody in the company. All right, I'm like way off on a tangent. I want to come back to your, how do we get new people thing? That's but, okay. Um, Again, we've got time. Okay. All right. So everybody in the company, we have at least two points of contact. Um, we, we structure it this way. So you have your project line. So you're, you're, you're the team you're on the project you're working on the project manager that you work with. And then you also have deliberately not on your project. You have a mentor. This is true for everybody in the company. Um, and you have a separate mentor and the whole purpose of those two things and different people gravitate to different things. Some people super thrilled on their project. Don't, don't touch anything. I'm good. I'm loving what I'm doing. They're cruising along and they're neck deep in the project. Awesome. No problem. Other people are like, here's where I want to go next. Like I'm, my project is cool. It's fine, but I'd really like my next project to be X or I, as in my career path someday, I want to be director of engineering or director of user experience or whatever, or I want to learn how the business side works, or I want to learn how we do marketing. Well, pick your, pick your thing. 
So the purpose, then they talk to their mentors about that. And it's deliberately not on the project. So the project has no like conflict of interest of like, yeah, that'd be cool if you did that, but then my stories aren't going to get finished. So let's just focus on the stories, right? We, we separate those two things. The mentor's job is to work with the, you know, their mentee and um, develop goals and objectives. And, you know, here are some certifications, here's some training you can do. Here's, I'm going to keep an eye out for a project for you that, that needs this or that, um, whatever it is. Like, you know, there's, there's a endless kind of different options we can do there. But the whole purpose of that is to drive that, um, is kind of that career growth for, for individuals and kind of how do they want to progress and what are they interested in and what do they want to do? And so then inevitably that feeds into the, okay, so I've got, you know, two people that want to do this or that, like, okay, let's find some opportunities for that. And that drives growth. And, and so it's very right. much a people oriented okay. growth decision or growth um, pressure. Yeah. So that, um, uh, no, go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was going to jump over to the, how do we get people thing, but go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Let's go. Okay. So, um, the number one way and the most successful way um, in terms of like long-term retention and, and happiness and everything else um, is uh, friends of friends and network uh, colleagues and networks and things like that. So, you know, we'll pick up one person for whatever reason, you know, whatever they, if they're looking for a change or, you know, maybe they're whatever it is, but we, we pick someone up, they get settled in. Um, they get happy, uh, they enjoy it. And then inevitably they'll go call like, oh, we really need this person in here. Like this, I, I worked with this girl over here. She's amazing. Let's pull her into like, she'd be so great here. She would fill our needs. So we try to be good internally about saying, here's what we need. And, uh, and then inevitably somebody pulls in somebody that they used to work with that they want to work with again. Um, and uh, that is by far most, it, it's not always scalable. Um, sometimes, you know, you kind of saturate, you, you saturate the network of, of people, but um, that is generally the best. Um, and what you get are, you know, what are referred to as like passive candidates. These are people who may not have necessarily been looking, um, you know, they're not, uh, they're, they're just, they're friends of friends and somebody approaches them and says like, Hey, this would be, this is awesome over here. Do you want to come over? And, and they'll come talk to us. And um, we will also do uh, like, we'll play the long game. Um, we have had some people that we have talked to for years before they finally decide to jump. Um, we've had people that come in to go through, we have a, we have a pretty long interview process. Um, it's not, it's not trivial. They'll go through the whole process. They'll get to the end and they're like, I'm totally in, uh, but I just, I don't want to, you know, I have a baby coming or pick your thing. I don't want to make the change now. Is that okay? Like, that's, that's absolutely okay. I mean, not ideal, but like, absolutely. Like call us back when you're ready to, you know, when you're, when you're at that stage. So we have some people that have taken years to get over into the company, but they'll come. Um, but I, I think that is, um, that kind of networking has been the best, but when we do all the, the other usual things, you know, um, job postings and LinkedIn and networking at, at conferences and that kind of stuff. But by far the best is get people that we like in the company and then have them bring the people they like with them. Um, and then, you know, you, you have a much better chance of success that those people are gonna fit in and, and, and do well there. You were mentioning the interview process a bit long and like, what, how, how are you approaching interviewing? So we do, um, uh, we start with a phone screen um, and that's, it's really just to kind of do like some high level sanity checking, you know, here's the kind of company we are, <clears throat> what are you looking for, et cetera, I kind of do some phone screening. It's just kind of just to do a first pass filter. Um, we'll then do a little bit of a technical interview. Um, we do that uh, remotely, like we do that over you know, Zoom or whatever. Um, and the idea is we want the person to be, it, it's not like a whiteboard gotcha kind of test. It's like, use your equipment in your environment. We want you to be as comfortable as possible. Um, just give us a sense of, like, it, it's just kind of that next level screening, right? Like we, we're not trying to, to trick anybody or trap anybody or if they get nervous on an interview, like it's really as best as possible, like, sh you know, just get comfortable and, um, and let's work on some stuff together. Okay. So as soon they get through that part. Um, so now we get to uh, kind of our bigger interview piece of it. And we have a project, we have a, we have a handful of projects, we have several projects, um, depending on what position they're looking for. And then we have a couple per position and we'll give them a project. Um, and the purpose of the project, and we, we say this in the write up for the projects is there's not like a single right answer. It's deliberately not a, you know, did you get this right? It's not that kind of a thing. Um, and they're generally large enough that 
and we say this too, like we don't expect you to finish the whole, like get the whole thing done. Like this is, some of these are huge. Like for example, we don't use this one anymore, but one of our early ones was um, build um, Google analytics. Like you want to build a website, like you, you, you're, you, you have people who have websites and they want to track metrics of, you know, visitors and all that kind of stuff, like build Google analytics. Um, and obviously like that's a massive undertaking kind of a thing, right? So we, we tell folks like, you know, lean on the parts that you're most comfortable with. Like, this is your chance to show off, like show us what you can do and also come in with the parts that stumped you and let's talk about it. And the reason we do this is we want a common thing that we can all talk about. And so, so we give them this project and they, they work on it. And sometimes we'll get questions like, how many hours am I supposed to spend? And there's not, we can give some like some general guidance, but there's not like a, make sure you put at least X hour. It, it's not that it's like, this is your opportunity. This is what we're going to talk about. This is what we're going to drill into. This is your opportunity to, to show off and, and walk us through this. So spend whatever you're comfortable with. Um, Cause I think it is reflective also of the personality of the individual. So anyway, then they come in for the in-person interview and they bring their project. And um, on the day of the in-person interview, uh, we have a social, uh, we call it the social experiment. Um, Tracy and I are not there, but they get a chance to meet with some team members. And, um, and uh, sometimes people talk about work. Uh, sometimes they don't. Like sometimes it's purely just what are your hobbies and that kind of stuff. But it's a, it, it's a coffee hour kind of a thing. Um, then they have a separate meeting with just Tracy and I, and really that is for them to be able to ask us any questions they want. We'll answer everything we can, um, full philosophy of the company, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we meet with the team and then it becomes the candidates show and they present their project and they walk through, um, uh, you know, what have they built and, and take us through it. And we, we coach them to say, pretend this is the team you're going to be working with. Like this is, you know, you've been working on this project for a little bit. You've got these team members coming in, walk them through what works, what doesn't, what you liked, what you learned, what, you know, how, like walk them, onboard them onto your project. And then inevitably that turns into discussions. And we warn the candidate of this too. Like we're going to push and ask, I mean, we've done this, you know, a, a million times. So we kind of know where all the hard parts are or where a lot of the hard parts are. And we'll ask, and we want to see how does the candidate deal with that like you know, are they you know are they curious are they asking questions do they bristle at you know do they get defensive if something doesn't work or like it, it's that whole dynamic just as best we can to simulate working together um and, and kind of put that together but it's a big lift on the candidate's part and we understand that and we really appreciate it um but uh so far it's worked out real well for us there's a there's another thing i wanted to come back to is is about like building the, the culture that you've built this is a bit far from the whole geospatial side, but I'm, I'm still like interested because we started talking about it. So I'd, I'd be curious to know, like, what are the things that, that you've uh, kind of actively or, or not done to, to try to build the culture that you have today? Sweet. A ask that question again. Sorry. Like, what things have we, like, which things so are not finished? No, no, or... no, no. Like, like, what have you done? Like, how have you built the, a culture? Uh, as the company grows, because you were saying at the very beginning, like, you know, let's start this company and it's not going to ex exceed five people. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's okay. easy because you just probably gotcha. know everybody already. And it's like, right. if you're yep. a big dorm, but yep. now it's 60, I think you, you mentioned. Yep. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that changes as well from how you, you, you work with people. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, sometimes being totally honest, uh, it's forced on you. Um, mm. So for example, when you get to like 25, like, so I call, I mentioned at the very beginning, I was with a small company, right. And we got, we grew and then we got acquired and everything else. Um, when we hit 25 people, I think it was 25. Um, I called, no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It was 25. Uh, it was 20 because we, we needed to get to 25. We were at 20. And uh, I called the woman who had founded um, the company I worked for before. And uh, her name was Jean. And I was just like, Jean, like the wheels are coming off. Like, this is a mess. And um, we, uh, Tracy and I were both on the phone with her and we're like, this is broken and this is broken and this is broken. And she's like, so you're what? She's like 20 people, right? And we're like, yes, like we're exactly 20 people. She's like, yeah, this is what's going to happen. And like, sometimes you just hit these natural breaking points of a company. Um, and sometimes they're stupid. I, I say stupid and like, and they're, they're important, but they're like frustrating. Like when you're five people, you can go buy a Wi-Fi router at Best Buy and everybody's happy. You know, when you're 25, 30, whatever people, like all the hardware starts falling apart. Like you have to level that up. And then when you level that up, well, now you need somebody to administrate that, right? Like 
or you've got a compliance thing you need to deal with or timesheets. When you're five people, you can all use Google spreadsheet, you know, use a Google sheet to track your time, all works great. When you're 60 people, that's a train wreck, right? Like, so sometimes you just have these internal things that break um, and you just have to kind of adapt and, and grow with those. Um, but sometimes they're social too, right? Like you get those social dynamics that like, the group can get to a certain size and then it's going to divide. And then when it divides, well, now you've got a communication challenge between those two groups. And how do you, how do you do consistent? Because when it's, when you're smaller, everybody can just walk in and, and like, they don't even have to walk in, like just they're constantly, you know, we're all having lunch together. And so kind of that informal chatter happens and um, people don't kind of feel disconnected as you get bigger, that gets harder and harder to maintain. So you've got to be more deliberate about it. Um, so, but I, I think that, so all of those are important. Um, uh, I can tell you uh, a couple of things that I, we got wrong um, or I, I got wrong, um, I'll own this one, but um, putting the leadership team in place was critically important. That was, that was vitally important. And then honestly, Tracy and I had to learn how to delegate and, and trust and hold people accountable and all that stuff. Um, and then obviously the leadership team that came in had to learn how to work with us and kind of figure that stuff out and, and what their new roles were and things like that. Um, we've had to learn how to set good objectives and kind of, um, and that way, like make sure that information flows and things like that. But the one that I could tell you, we, we got wrong. Um, we had um, for, you know, forever, the company was in great shape uh, where we've, um, we've generally been really open with everything. We're not, we don't really hold a lot close to the vest unless we have to. Um, but uh, at the beginning, uh, just being transparent here, at the beginning of 2019, um, we were rotating, we had one project ramping down, a big project ramping down and a new project coming in, or we, we needed some new projects coming in to kind of offset that. And um, we uh, didn't, we, we talked a lot about, okay, like, what do we talk to the company about? Like, what do we say? And we're like, there's just no point like having that conversation because there's no reason for people to be, we don't want people to be nervous. We don't want people to feel like their jobs at risk or anything like that. Um, but, um, and so like, just they'll keep doing, let them keep executing on the projects and we'll figure out kind of the BD side. Um, BD had, that's actually probably a great example. Prior to that, BD had, business development had been very informal. It had always been very organic and just conversations. Um, we got to a certain size where that just doesn't scale anymore. Like you kind of have to be deliberate about it and you want to go after bigger things, which means they have a longer lead time and all that stuff, right? So it's, you have to be more deliberate about it. And we weren't good at it um, at this point. Um, we were working on it, but we weren't good at it. And um, we didn't really talk to the team about this going on. And so it led to some confusion on the team side. Like, I don't understand, like, why did we take this project? It's a little different than we would normally take, or why are we doing this thing or whatever? And what we learned was like, that was completely the wrong way to go with the team. We should have been transparent um, much more quickly and, and conveyed here's where we were. And so we, we made a bunch of changes. We put in place, like we, we report financials to the entire company um, on, on a monthly basis. Like here's where we are, income, profit, revenue, blah, 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 the picture, whole thing. Um, and so when COVID hit in 2020, we had a whole discussion about like, okay, like this is our chance to prove ourselves. Like we don't know where this is going to go. Like the world is locking down. We don't know what this is going to look like. Um, but we told everybody, we promise we'll be transparent with everything. Like here's our revenue numbers. Here's our targets. Like we, you know, and we would go through this once a month and it went so much better. Um, and it was a great, uh, it was a great learning experience for us um, in terms of that, again, that like open communication and building that trust internally. Um, there's a book, uh, Great Game of Business by Jack Stack that um, kind of talks about kind of the open books business model. We're not quite, I wouldn't say we're quite open book, uh, like literally open book, but um, we are really, really transparent on just about everything um, and, and how all that stuff works. So all of these are lessons learned we've had to figure out as we've, as we've grown. Right. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah, no, totally. Thanks. Okay. Um, I again, want to pivot a little bit. Like this is one of those questions that I just wonder about. Um, do you, how have you, um, all right, let me rephrase that as there's more and more people, I'm sure your role specifically has changed a lot. Like what you do, on a day-to-day -day basis has changed a lot. Um, I'm very curious, like, are you still like at 
any part of it very hands-on for like still coding or stuff like that even like not necessarily for like when you're wearing the ceo hat but like in the evening or something mm -hmm. how, how have you dealt with that yeah so all right maybe i get all the touchy feely stuff so um <laughs> this has been uh, this was hard for me to be completely honest right like i i, I have a computer science degree i have a uh, mathematics uh, background mathematics minor um like i am that's that was my bread and butter um as uh as the company has grown i've had to get a little bit removed from that now i still have a cto hat which uh is wonderful um which lets me stay technical um my director of engineering um she has picked up a lot of what i i've, I've moved some of the things over to her and um that's been hard i'm not gonna lie about it right it's been a little bit harder to get for the removed but um, so from like a day-to-day -day execution. So I don't code on projects anymore. I did in the beginning, um, but now like they don't let me now, you know, they'll, they'll politely, they'll, they'll entertain my questions and that kind of stuff, but they'll politely like, no, we got this. Um, uh, but in terms of, um, for my personal, I think both from a job perspective, but also from my personal interests and things like that. Yes. I still very much code at night. Um, I AWS certified and that kind of stuff. Like I, it, it's what I enjoy. It's what I'm passionate about. Um, recently I've shifted my focus, um, to be, to go deeper on the geospatial side. Um, cause again, my background's in computer science. I don't have a, you know, a GIS degree or geospatial degree or remote sensing degree or anything like in that kind of space. So like, um, it, I don't know, maybe it sounds horrible, but like sitting down and reading a good book on SAR is kind of fascinating, right? Like how this stuff works uh, at, at a lower level, a level that I wouldn't get just by kind of playing around with the data. Um, so um, uh, I think it's really important for me to stay plugged in. And I do, with my CTO hat, I do get to stay plugged in on the technical side of things like architecture reviews. And it's it's pretty common. There are a couple, there are a couple of clients we have that I am still very much plugged into um and um from like a, a technical advisory kind of capacity or like a, that kind of a thing um but i don't get to cut code on like a day-to-day -day basis anymore how important do you think it is if at all to still do some of the coding on the side that you're doing and still learning on the geospatial side or or anything actually but still have a part of your time that is just writing some code when like you're the CEO of like a 60 people software company. Uh, for me, I think it's a, I think it could be a personal decision, but um, I think in the general sense, right? If you start at the higher level, I think it's critical to always be learning something. I think it's unbelievably important to um, always be challenging yourself, always be learning something new and, and kind of keeping that, uh, keeping that going. So then it's a question of kind of like, what do you want to learn about and what do you want to stay engaged in? Um, I split my time between kind of your traditional CEO kinds of things and, and reading and learning about that and people dynamics and things like that. Um, and culture and the stuff that we've talked about. Some of it's like just lessons learned, some of it's active reading and everything else. Um, but for me, um, you know, my passions are on the technical side. And I think that's where my skill set, I think that's where you know, my strengths lie. Um, and so I need to feed that. I need to keep that going. I need to stay current um, and, and kind of push it. And some of it is just, it's, it's what I enjoy. And it's what gets me excited. And I think a lot of times, so um, I think this is a Scott Hanselman quote um, uh, who is now at Microsoft, but uh, yeah, I say now he's been there for a long time, but um, he had talked about people with, um, he, he likes people with batteries included. And uh, that stuck with me. And this is, uh, I can't even tell you how many years ago I, I initially read that, but I agree. You want people that come with batteries included. Like these are people who are excited. These are people who contribute, like they're, you know, they're, um, they're exuding energy and they're, they're contributing to, they're driving things forward. And you need to feed that, right? That comes from somewhere. And some people, some people draw energy from other people. Like they have, they, they, they kind of, it's like you have to invest energy in that person to keep them going. And there's other people that come in and contribute a net gain of energy. And so for me, um, you know, keeping up with things and uh, going through, you know, whether it's an AWS certification or learning to use, learning about this new data product or how this thing works or whatever, all of those are exciting and fascinating and, and, and energizing for me, which then means I get to bring that back into the company of like, here are some ideas and I'm excited to hear about this. Or I'm excited to talk about this. Um, 
And so for me, it's, it's critically important. If I didn't do it, um, I would get stale and boring. <laughs> right. I, I guess I'm seeing that as like, um, how as a CEO, you tackle this like opportunity cost of all the different things that you could be learning yeah. about. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how, how have you thought about that? Um, that, that is hard. Um, and I don't want to sit here and pretend I've got this figured out. Um, the critical thing for me, so I, I think it's, so this is a boring answer. Um, job descriptions are important. Um, like writing up and saying like, okay, look, this is, this is my, these, these things are my responsibility. These things are Tracy's responsibility. These things are Lauren, our director of engineering responsibility and Scott, our COO and Jeff, our director of user experience. You know, these are your responsibilities. This is your house. Like you need to make that go as a CEO. Um, and I, and my Tracy is uh, president. So we, we kind of split some of these things. Um, she has more of the business side. Um, and, uh, but there's a certain dimension of it. Like if, if, part of what I'm supposed to do is, you know, kind of drive forward. Okay. Where are we going with some of the technical pieces of the stuff or what are our technical offerings or whatever I need to, part of that is I need to keep up with like, what are the actual demands? And then it becomes like, okay, how do you do it? Right. And so I, I'm in customer meetings, I'm doing things on my own on the side. Like I'm trying to learn these things, like I'm kind of to keep a pulse of the community um, or the, the direction that things are going. Um, and then in order to execute some of those things, well, all right, we need to be doing like, what's our marketing look like? Because we've got to communicate these things out. Like, how do we talk about these things? Which then means I turn to Jeff as our director of user experience. And I'm like, Hey, what's our market? Like, what's our marketing plan? How are we going to talk about this? Like, what is the user experience of dealing with element 84? And, um, and, and then that's his wheelhouse. And he kind of repeats that pattern. And then he has people that work on his team that he does the same thing with them. Like, okay, this is what I need you to be driving. So um, there, it is a constant uh, tug of war over time and kind of prioritization exercise. Um, I think what I have learned as the company has grown the most is that the more in a leadership position you are, the more um, prioritization skills and learning what to say no to and learning what to say yes to, um, the more important those skills are and, and knowing when you, the right answer is to delegate it. That is so hard when the right answer is like, yes, I could do this and I would love to do this. I want nothing more than to do this, but that is not the right use of my time. I should give this to so-and-so because it's a learning opportunity for them. Um, to take on something bigger and harder. And so it, it's better for them and it lets you free up time to look at the next big thing that you want to go tackle or that, you know, that's a company we should be tackling. Um, but man, that's so hard to let go of those things sometimes. I can, I can only imagine, yeah. Um, Dan, that's been a pretty cool conversation. I want to start rounding this off. Yeah. Um, I like ending it as well with the same question um, every single time. Um, if there's any books that you might have read recently or podcast media, whatever, um, I, I, again, I like the podcast and books because usually they're harder to find. So it's a lot of word of mouth. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned one earlier, but if there's anything else that, that you think could be uh, that, that you've just enjoyed and is worth uh, recommending geospatial or not. Yeah. Um, I think, okay. So let me, let me think uh, from a, a culture and, diversity perspective, like an ID and E kind of perspective. Um, there's a book called Dear White Friend uh, that is fantastic. Um, I'm actually in a, uh, I joke and we call it a CEO support group, but it's, um, it, the group is called Tugboat. Uh, it's a people oriented private company um, group. Uh, and the author of that is part of that group. And he gave a phenomenal talk um, at one of the events, it's publicly available. Um, it's called Dear White Friend and um, at, at a Tugboat. And uh, the book is also fantastic. And I, I really enjoyed that one. Um, there's another book, recent one, it's kind of, it's, it's all over the YouTubes um, called uh, 4,000 Weeks, uh, which also is kind of this emphasis on um, prioritization and skill sets and things like that. And I think that, um, uh, not skill sets, I guess, but like prioritization and uh, kind of what do you say no to so that you're effective at what you're getting, um, what you're doing. Um, I would put those two pretty near the top of my list, at least in terms of recent books that I've read that I've really enjoyed. Um, 
I would promote your podcast. Uh, that's, that's the right <laughs> thing. People need to be listening to more of these, but uh, yeah, I totally agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right. I mean, that's, that's where it's at. Totally objective. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's also one, uh, this is an old one, um, manager tools. Uh, there's a lot of good material. If you go to there, they have like a hall of fame. Um, these are all on the business side of things. Um, there's a hall of fame, uh, website you can go to for manager tools and they have like their classics like how to run a meeting uh how to do one-on-ones um how to how to have hard conversations like there's just a couple just fundamental skill set ones that i think are fantastic they're really really good awesome thanks a lot for coming here and spending some of your valuable time with me this has been a, a really cool conversation thanks a lot oh it was an absolute pleasure thanks for having me um that was a blast i'm sorry for the tapping <laughs> I'll edit all of it out <laughs> if I can. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks so much. I really did have a great time. This is an awesome conversation.